This is Gods of the North by Robert E. Howard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Phil Chenevere. Gods of the North by Robert E. Howard. Part One. The clangor of the swords had died away, the shouting of the slaughter was hushed. Silence lay on the red-stained snow. The pale, bleak sun that glittered so blindingly from the ice-fields and the snow-covered plains struck sheens of silver from rent corselet and broken blade, where the dead lay in heaps. The nerveless hand yet gripped the broken hilt. Helmeted heads, back drawn in their death throes, tilted red beards and golden beards grimly upward, as if in last invocation to Emir, the frost giant. Across the red drifts and mail clad forms, two figures approached one another. In that utter desolation, only they moved. The frosty sky was over them the white illimitable plain around them, the dead men at their feet. Slowly through the corpses they came, as ghosts might come to a tryst through the shambles of a world. Their shields were gone, their corselets dented, blood smeared their mail, their swords were red, their horned helmets showed the marks of fierce strokes. One spoke, he whose locks and beard were red as the blood on the sunlit snow. "'Man of the raven locks,' said he, "'tell me your name, so that my brothers in Vanaheim may know who was the last of Wolfhair's band to fall before the sword of Heimdul.' "'This is my answer,' replied the black-haired warrior. "'Hot in Vanaheim.' But in Valhalla will you tell your brothers the name of Amra of Akbitana? Heimdall roared and sprang, and his sword swung in a mighty arc. Amra staggered, and his vision was filled with red sparks as the blade shivered into bits of blue fire on his helmet. But as he reeled, he thrust with all the power of his great shoulders. The sharp point drove through brass scales and bones and heart, and the red-haired warrior died at Amra's feet. Amra stood, swaying, trailing his sword, a sudden sick weariness assailing him. The glare of the sun on the snow cut his eyes like a knife, and the sky seemed shrunken and strangely far. He turned away from the trampled expanse where yellowed bearded warriors lay locked with red-haired slayers in the embrace of death. A few steps he took, and the glare of the snowfields was suddenly dimmed. A rushing wave of blindness engulfed him, and he sank down into the snow, supporting himself on one mailed arm, seeking to shake the blindness out of his eyes like a lion might shake his mane. A silvery laugh cut through his dizziness, and his sight cleared slowly. There was a strangeness about all the landscape that he could not place or define, an unfamiliar tinge to earth and sky, but he did not think long of this. Before him, swaying like a sapling in the wind, stood a woman. Her body was like ivory, and, save for a veil of gossamer, she was naked as the day. Her slender bare feet were whiter than the snow they spurned. She laughed, and her laughter was sweeter than the rippling of silvery fountains, and poisonous with cruel mockery. "'Who are you?' demanded the warrior. "'What matter?' Her voice was more musical than a silver-stringed harp, but it was edged with cruelty. "'Call up your men.' he growled, grasping his sword. Though my strength fail me, yet they shall not take me alive. I see that you are of the Vonner. Have I said so? 
He looked again at her unruly locks, which he had thought to be red. Now he saw that they were neither red nor yellow, but a glorious compound of both colors. He gazed spellbound. Her hair was like elfin gold, striking which the sun dazzled him. Her eyes were neither wholly blue nor wholly gray, but of shifting colors and dancing lights, and clouds of colors he could not recognize. Her full red lips smiled, and from her slim feet to the blinding crown of her billowy hair, her ivory body was as perfect as the dream of a god. Amra's pulse hammered in his temples. "'I cannot tell,' said he, "'whether you are of Vanaheim and mine enemy, or of Asgard and my friend. Far have I wandered, from Zingara to the sea of Vilayet, in Stygia and Kush, and the country of the Hyrcanians. But a woman like you I have never seen. Your locks blind me with their brightness.' Not even among the fairest daughters of the Aesir have I seen such hair by Emir. Who are you to swear by Emir? she mocked. What know you of the gods of ice and snow? You who have come up from the south to adventure among strangers? By the dark gods of my own race, he cried in anger. Have I been backward in the sword play, stranger or no? This day... I have seen four score warriors fall, and I alone survived the field where Mulfhair's reavers met the men of Braki. Tell me, woman, have you caught the flash of mail across the snow plains, or seen armed men moving upon the ice? I have seen the hoar-frost glittering in the sun, she answered. I have heard the wind whispering across the everlasting snows. He shook his head. <sighs> Niord should have come up with us before the battle joined. I fear he and his warriors have been ambushed. Wolf Hair lies dead with all his weapon men. I had thought there was no village within many leagues of this spot, for the war carried us far. But you can have come no great distance over these snows, naked as you are. Lead me to your tribe, if you are of Asgard, for I am faint with the weariness of strife. My dwelling place is farther than you can walk, Amra of Akbitana, she laughed. Spreading wide her arms, she swayed before him, her golden head lolling wantonly, her scintillating eyes shadowed beneath long silken lashes. Am I not beautiful, man? Like dawn running naked on the snows he muttered, his eyes burning like those of a wolf. Then why do you not rise and follow me? Who is the strong warrior who falls down before me? She chanted in maddening mockery. Lie down and die in the snow with the other fools, Amra of the black hair. You cannot follow where I would lead. With an oath the man heaved himself upon his feet, his blue eyes blazing, his dark scarred face convulsed. Rage shook his soul, but desire for the taunting figure before him hammered at his temples and drove his wild blood riotously through his veins. Passion, fierce as physical agony, flooded his whole being, so that earth and sky swam red to his dizzy gaze, and weariness and faintness were swept from him in madness. He spoke no word as he drove at her, fingers hooked like talons. With a shriek of laughter she leaped back and ran, laughing at him over her white shoulder. With a low growl Amra followed. He had forgotten the fight, forgotten the mailed warriors who lay in their blood, forgotten Niard's belated reavers. He had only thought for the slender white shape which seemed to float rather than run before him. Out across the white, blinding plain she led him. The trampled red field fell out of sight behind him, but still Amra kept on with the silent tenacity of his race. His mailed feet broke through the frozen crust. He sank deep in the drifts and forged through them by sheer strength. But the girl, 
danced across the snow as light as a feather floating across a pool. Her naked feet scarcely left their imprint on the hoar-frost. In spite of the fire in his veins, the cold bit through the warrior's mail and furs. But the girl, in her gossamer veil, ran as lightly and as gaily as if she danced through the palms and rose gardens of Poitain. Black curses drooled through the warrior's parched lips. The great veins swelled and throbbed in his tipples, and his teeth gnashed spasmodically. "'You cannot escape me,' he roared. "'Lead me into a trap, and I'll pile the heads of your kinsmen at your feet. Hide from me, and I'll tear apart the mountains to find you. I'll follow you to hell and beyond hell.' Her maddening laughter floated back to him, and foam flew from the warrior's lips. Farther and farther into the wastes she led him, till he saw the wide plains give way to low hills, marching upward in broken ranges. Far to the north he caught a glimpse of towering mountains, blue with the distance or white with the eternal snows. Above these mountains shone the flaring rays of the Borealis. They spread fanwise into the sky, frosty blades of cold, flaming light, changing in color, growing and brightening. Above him the skies glowed and crackled with strange lights and gleams. The snow shone weirdly, now frosty blue, now icy crimson, now cold silver. Through a shimmering, icy realm of enchantment, Amra plunged doggedly onward, in a crystalline maze where the only reality was the white body dancing across the glittering snow beyond his reach, ever beyond his reach. Yet he did not wonder at the necromantic strangeness of it all, not even when two gigantic figures rose up to bar his way. The scales of their mail were white with hoar-frost, their helmets and their axes were sheathed in ice. Snow sprinkled their locks, in their beards were spikes of icicles, their eyes were cold as the lights that streamed above them. "'Brothers!' cried the girl, dancing between them. "'Look who follows! I have brought you a man for the feasting. Take his heart, that we may lay it smoking on our father's board.' The giants answered with roars like the grinding of icebergs on a frozen shore, and heaved up their shiny axes as the maddened Akbatanen hurled himself upon them. A frosty blade flashed before his eyes, blinding him with its brightness, and he gave back a terrible stroke that sheared through his foe's thigh. With a groan the victim fell and at the instant Amra was dashed into the snow, his left shoulder numb from the blow of the survivor, from which the warrior's mail had barely saved his life. Amra saw the remaining giant looming above him like a colossus carved of ice etched against the glowing sky. The axe fell, to sink through the snow and deep into the frozen earth, as Amra hurled himself aside and leaped to his feet. The giant roared and wrenched the axe head free, but even as he did so, Amra's sword sang down. The giant's knees bent, and he sank slowly into the snow, which turned crimson with the blood that gushed from his half-severed neck. Amra wheeled, to see the girl standing a short distance away, staring in wide-eyed horror, all mockery gone from her face. He cried out fiercely, and the blood drops flew from his sword as his hand shook in the intensity of his passion. "'Call the rest of your brothers,' he roared. "'Call the dogs. I'll give their hearts to the wolves.' With a cry of fright she turned and fled. She did not laugh now, nor mock him over her shoulder. She ran as for her life though he strained every nerve and thew until his temples were like to burst and the snow swam red to his gaze she drew away from him dwindling in the witch fire of the skies until she was a figure no bigger than a child 
then a dancing white flame on the snow, then a dim blur in the distance. But grinding his teeth until the blood started from his gums, he reeled on, and he saw the blur grow to a dancing white flame, and then she was running less than a hundred paces ahead of him, and slowly the space narrowed, foot by foot. She was running with effort now, her golden locks blowing free. He heard the quick panting of her breath, and saw a flash of fear in the look she cast over her alabaster shoulder. The grim endurance of the warrior had served him well. The speed ebbed from her flashing white legs. She reeled in her gait. In his untamed soul flamed up the fires of hell she had fanned so well. With an inhuman roar he closed in on her just as she wheeled with a haunting cry and flung out her arms to fend him off. His sword fell into the snow as he crushed her to him. Her supple body bent backwards as she fought with desperate frenzy in his iron arms. Her golden hair blew about his face, blinding him with its sheen. The feel of her slender figure twisting in his mailed arms drove him to blinder madness. His strong fingers sank deep into her smooth flesh, and that flesh was cold as ice. It was as if he embraced not a woman of human flesh and blood, but a woman of flaming ice. She writhed her golden head aside, striving to avoid the savage kisses that bruised her red lips. "'You are as cold as the snows,' he mumbled dazedly. I will warm you with the fire in my own blood. With a desperate wrench she twisted from his arms, leaving her single gossamer garment in his grasp. She sprang back and faced him, her golden locks in wild disarray, her white bosom heaving, her beautiful eyes blazing with terror. For an instant he stood frozen, awed by her terrible beauty as she posed naked against the snows. And in that instant she flung her arms toward the lights that glowed in the skies above her, and cried out in a voice that rang in Amran's ears for ever after, Emir, oh, my father, save me! Amra was leaping forward, arms spread to seize her, when, with a crack like the breaking of an ice mountain, the whole skies leaped into icy fire. The girl's ivory body was suddenly enveloped in a cold blue flame so blinding that the warrior threw up his hands to shield his eyes. A fleeting instant, skies and snowy hills were bathed in crackling white flames, blue darts of icy light with frozen crimson fires. Then Amra staggered and cried out. The girl was gone. The glowing snow lay empty and bare. High above him the witch lights flashed and played in a frosty sky gone mad, and among the distant blue mountains there sounded a rolling thunder as of a gigantic war chariot rushing behind steeds whose frantic hoofs struck lightning from the snows and echoes from the skies. Then suddenly the borealis, the snowy hills, and the blazing heavens reeled drunkenly to Amra's sight. Thousands of fireballs burst with showers of sparks, and the sky itself became a titanic wheel which rained stars as it spun. Under his feet the snowy hills heaved up like a wave, and the Akbatanan crumpled into the snows to lie motionless. End of Part One